you'll just like indulge me here for a second. <laughs> I don't think researching a video has ever made me feel more culturally outdated than digging through the world of Skylanders. Watching videos and reading posts of fans of this series being like, oh man, everyone loved Skylanders when I was a kid, and thinking, eh, yeah, I guess being in college is still a kid. It's been so fun revisiting it again now that I'm an adult at 19. Ugh. For me, Skylanders was barely a blip on my radar at the time. Being the fossil that I apparently am, to me, this is what Spyro the Dragon is, and to a lesser extent, this. When Skylanders was announced, I specifically remember the general reaction from people my age both online and in person to be pretty underwhelming. These games felt nothing like the series that came before it, and I realized pretty quickly Spyro was being used to leverage what was most likely initially conceived as, and essentially became, its own IP. I mean, just look at Spyro in this game. It's pretty clear the established art direction of Spyro didn't influence Skylanders all that much. Their art direction was reverse engineered back onto him, with pretty hideous results if I'm being honest. Hashtag not my Spyro. Like, it really feels like they were already working on this game and they just happened to have a purple dragon design and decided to tweak it a bit and call him Spyro. I can't actually find any info to back this up and by all accounts it seems like this game started as a Spyro spin-off IP revival from developer Toys for Bob, but I would have put money on this being an IP retrofit before I started researching this video. I suppose that's why I'm not a betting man. At least Cinder made the transition a bit more gracefully though. That being said, everything else in Skylanders actually looks pretty good. Even though the series was originally designed to run on the Wii, the series all the way back to the original game from 2011 still holds up really well visually due to its painterly stylized art direction. Gee, who would've guessed? So yeah, Spyro himself was kind of pretzeled into a scaly, pug-snouted abomination to fit this new art direction. However, the vast majority of other characters are all really cool looking and creative, with a large amount of diversity in design, which makes sense, character design is literally the monetization strategy here. These creatures all better look cool and different enough that you're gonna want to bug your parents to take you to Toys R Us and blow your allowance on them. Again, the fate of Activision's shareholders depends on it. But perhaps we're getting a bit ahead of ourselves here. What exactly was Skylanders? And how did Spyro go from being an iconic mascot that helped define the modern 3D platformer to becoming a Trojan horse for kickstarting an entire gaming subgenre, only for the thing to collapse on itself less than a decade later? Well, the concept for Skylanders Spyro's Adventure originated from Toys for Bob, a gaming studio led by co-founders Paul Reich III and Fred Ford. The team, having been recently acquired by Activision, was given the opportunity to work with their choice of currently dormant franchises in the company's stable for their next project. Activision themselves had acquired Spyro after merging with previous owner Vivendi Games around the same time. The concept of Skylanders underwent quite a few twists and turns before arriving at the money printing machine that was released in 2011. Initially, the game was conceived as a more traditional reboot of the Spyro franchise, and was even given a working title Spyro's Kingdom as of June 2009. Toys for Bob initially considered making a mature Spyro game with a darker tone. However, they soon realized that this direction did not feel true to the essence of Spyro, and pivoted towards a more all-ages concept that was more in line with the original trilogy of games, in tone if not in gameplay. Paul Reich figured that simply creating a new Spyro game in the traditional fashion was unlikely to succeed. The Legend of Spyro series had tried with the more gritty reboot angle already, and while they weren't bad games, they also weren't nearly as well received as the classic PS1 titles. For the most part. The team spent some time exploring various directions for Spyro, backed by the time and budget provided by Activision. Executive producer Jeff Poffenbarger stated that the game was eventually geared towards younger gamers who had no prior knowledge of the Spyro character. The breakthrough came when they decided to integrate game design with toys, a concept that Reich had been considering for a while outside of their Spyro project. Hey, so I was half right. Taking this idea in combination with Spyro, they wanted to create a whole new universe and context for the character, where toys could come to life and be used directly to influence the game. The idea was to use RFID technology embedded in toys that could be read by a physical accessory connected to the host machine, which they'd end up calling the Portal of Power, thereby transferring the toys' data into the game, merging the physical with the virtual. Thus Skylanders Spyro's Adventure was born. The gameplay of Skylanders is a blend of action-adventure and platforming elements, designed to be accessible yet engaging for people of any age and skill level. 
players assume the role of a portal master, who can control various Skylanders characters, including, obviously, Spyro himself. The game is set in a magical world creatively titled The Skylands, where players can explore, battle enemies, collect treasures, and solve puzzles. Of course, an action platformer is hardly an innovative idea. The gimmick here is taking that solid foundation and combining it with the portal and figures, the whole toys to life concept. The Portal Master, the player, actually exists in the canon of the Skylanders storyline. In the story, the Skylanders characters have all been banished from their home realm by an evil Portal Master named Zim. Uh, I mean, Chaos. <laughs> head is awesome, I tell you! And finds themselves miniaturized and teleported here on Earth. Because our world lacks the magical essence to sustain them, the Skylanders remain in a petrified state, aka toys. It's up to the players of Skylanders Spire's Adventure to restore them and get them back to their original world. Let's not even comment on the ethical questions of selling what are canonically petrified extra-dimensional prisoners to children and then leveraging their immersion in the story by tying a purchase to also liberating a trapped character in the fiction of the game they're playing. Chaos may be the villain here, but Activision is the real evil, both in the Skylander story and in real life. Anyways, if you don't think too deeply or cynically about it, like the target audience probably isn't, the concept is pretty unique and does make for an immersive incentive to keep playing. Each Skylander character is represented by a physical toy that contains the aforementioned RFID chip. Once purchased and placed on the base, the captured Skylanders are returned to their home universe and together with the player, start making their way through the world to stop Invader Chaos's evil machinations. Traversing a smattering of different fantasy locales, combating monsters, gathering treasures, and solving puzzles in their mission to rescue their home. The figures are not just static representations either. The RFID chip in each toy store's key stats, including the character's level, items collected, and upgrades purchased. This means that as you play the game and your character gains new abilities or levels up, this information is saved directly onto the toy. You can then take your toy to a friend's house, place it on their portal of power, and your character, with all its stats and upgrades, will appear in their game. Moreover, the game allows for local co-op by enabling two figures to be placed on the portal simultaneously. This opens up a wide range of strategic possibilities, as players can switch between characters to utilize different elemental abilities and powers. Each Skylander also has its own elemental attribute, and special elemental gates within the game require a Skylander of a specific element to pass through, adding another layer of strategy to your team's composition. Now, if this sounds like a recipe to just rake in cash, my friend, you have no idea. The original Skylanders absolutely crushed it in terms of sales. In its first nine months on the market, Skylanders sold over 30 million figures and was on track to generate over $500 million in sales by the end of 2012, becoming the top selling game worldwide the year it was released. It crossed a billion dollars in sales six months later after only 15 months on the market. At its peak, Skylanders would be reported to be a $3 billion franchise by Activision. It was also well received critically. While adults were wary of the potential money trap the game's design presented, there was no denying the actual framing device created by Toys for Bob was pretty fun, and a novel concept in an industry that was quickly becoming formulaic and trend chasing by the 2010s. The original Skylander sits at a comfortable 78 on Metacritic from 35 outlets. Actually being a decent game at its core probably did a lot to help keep the franchise going for as long as it did. Now, remember, Skylanders was published by Activision. You know, that Activision. Well, technically it wasn't that Activision yet. Our boy wasn't CEO in 2011, but the culture certainly was there. So as soon as Skylanders started printing cash, the series was doomed to eventually burn itself out as the company did whatever they could to milk every last dime out of this concept. Like Activision seems to do with all its heavy hitters, going forward, Skylanders was forced into a yearly release cycle, with a new title dropping on every major platform each year between 2011 and 2016. And then, the copycat started popping up. I mean, it makes sense. You don't just print the better part of a billion dollars in a year and not get other CEO ghouls salivating. And so, we have Disney and Lego entering the fray. Toys are their bread and butter, after all, and they're here to play for keeps. Disney Infinity was the first challenger to appear. Arriving on the scene two years after Skylanders in 2013, it followed a nearly identical product strategy. An assortment of collectible figures to purchase, a base to scan them into, and an otherwise standard action-adventure game to justify selling all the plastic. The main difference came from the structure of the game. While Skylanders was all a single universe, 
Since it was its own franchise, Disney Infinity was a blend of multiple Disney properties brought together. Each set they sold had its own level pack, where you could only use the figures included in that set in that set's campaign. This was called playset mode. It was only in the more open toy box mode where players could mix and match characters from different franchises, which gave the player a bit less room for expression than what Skylanders allowed. LEGO Dimensions arrived a few years later in 2015. Developed by Traveler's Tales, it built on the gameplay foundation they established with their previous LEGO games like LEGO Star Wars, with the addition of scanning real LEGO minifigures in with the included base to unlock additional characters from both LEGO and other Warner Brothers franchises. Leveraging the LEGO IP, the scanning base to add figures would be a mini LEGO set all on its own that would have to be assembled by the player before it could be used. The battle lines had been drawn. With multiple entrants, the Toys to Life genre had been officially forged, and the battle of the billionaires to most effectively hustle allowance money out of gullible children to pad their bottom lines had begun. Skylanders had the advantage of being first on the market and a couple years of brand recognition in the Toys to Life genre compared to newcomers Disney and LEGO. But Disney and LEGO are you know, fucking Disney and Lego. Skylanders may have had a few years head start on them in this specific market, but both Disney and Lego had broad brand identities that span decades. There really was no comparison between the two in terms of bringing franchise bait to the table. This was the mid 2010s after all. Marvel is in full swing, we had yet to fully accept that Star Wars had been reduced to a puppeted corpse, and Disney Pixar's animation portfolio is an evergreen marketing goldmine. Similarly, LEGO Dimensions had the backing of Warner Brothers, so in addition to LEGO's own branding, they could pull from the massive IP vault of Warner and LEGO-fy them to bolster the appeal of their game. And pull they did, with DC, Adventure Time, Lord of the Rings, Ghostbusters, and even other gaming icons like Sonic joining their roster. Ironically, the only IP that Skylanders could really leverage was Spyro himself, where this entire series started. However, putting aside the fact that Spyro was nothing compared to the previously mentioned IP Titans, Skylanders as a series itself had put Spyro on the back burner ever since the original game, using his presence as little more than set dressing to get the new franchise off the ground, alienating most older fans like myself in the process so that we ended up largely ignoring the game entirely. To put it simply, if you're as ancient as I am and actually never played any of these games, can you name a Disney character? A Warner Brothers character? Now name a famous character from Skylanders. Okay, I mean besides him. Exactly. Something like Disney Infinity could play it a bit more iteratively with its core gameplay and fall back on merely expanding the IP available in the game to incentivize purchases. You know, Disney Infinity 2.0. It's Disney Infinity 1.0, but with Marvel this time. LEGO Dimensions never even really bothered to release another title, content to just let their stable of IP and expansion packs do the heavy lifting. Though they didn't last very long in general, so maybe they just never got a chance. And remember, these toys are all from established franchises that people love outside the context of the video game they're meant to promote, which means you could potentially even net some sales from people who weren't even into the game, but just thought the toys looked cool. I mean, look at this rocket raccoon. He's adorable. I'd buy that for a few bucks. On the other hand, Skylanders was, for all intents and purposes, its own IP. It didn't have a massive backlog of popular characters to leverage, so the figures didn't have that mass appeal angle. I mean, I ain't gonna go out of my way to buy Gnarly Barkley. <laughs> I'm sorry, Gnarly Barkley, what? Point is, I don't know what this is, so I don't care. That was the uphill battle Skylanders was facing. They couldn't rest on their laurels. So instead, each game, coming out every 12 months as per their corporate overlords, had to come up with a new gimmick in order to justify its existence. Each sequel to the original Skylanders game would add to the core gameplay in some way, though it conveniently would require additional figure purchases to truly leverage. In the series' defense, they would also make each title backwards compatible with every previously released Skylander figure, so longtime collectors could bring all their favorites forward to each new title. Combine that with a much more flexible composition overall, since Skylanders didn't have to contend with mixing multiple franchises, and it was a strong incentive in general to stay with Skylanders over the competition. In 2012, before either Disney or LEGO got involved in the space, the second Skylanders game, Skylanders Giants, would launch. Featuring double the amount of figures from the first game, the main addition were the titular giants, larger creatures that were able to leverage their larger in-game size to move heavier objects, and in real life by doubling the normal price of a Skylander figure from $10 to $20. In all, the game introduced 40 new Skylanders characters to the series. 
In 2013, they introduced Skylanders Swap Force, featuring a new cast of Skylanders with the ability to swap the top and bottom halves of the figures to create custom configurations. The game introduced 32 new Skylanders, 16 regular characters, and other 16 swappable figures. To support the swap function, the game required a new portal. So even if you've been reusing the portal you bought from the original game, you'd have to buy the new one to play this game. Another change was that this was the first entry in the series to be developed by another studio besides Toys for Bob. Swap Force was outsourced to another Activision-owned studio, Vicarious Visions, most likely to continue to allow yearly release cycles by having multiple studios working on titles at the same time. This would be the year of the next-gen consoles launching, so developing for these platforms would have added some complexity. A major change they introduced to the series was allowing characters to jump, introducing some platforming elements to the series on top of the action and puzzle solving. Skylanders Track Team was launched the following year in 2014. Development returned to Toys for Bob for this year. As the title would imply, the main gameplay addition here is the addition of traps, allowing players to place trap items on the Portal of Power and capture enemy monsters that could be used temporarily in-game, in addition to the main Skylanders heroes. On top of traps and playable enemies, Trap Team also introduced Skylanders Minis, essentially the opposite of Giants. They were smaller versions of existing Skylanders characters. In all, the game introduced 18 new core Skylanders, 18 Trap Master Skylanders, and 8 Elite Eon figures with shiny paint jobs, for a total of 44 new figures, not including the traps themselves. 2015 saw the release of Skylanders Superchargers, which combined the adventure design of traditional Skylanders with a full-on Mario Kart vehicle racing mechanic. The game introduced 17 new Skylanders, as well as matching vehicles for them to drive. The larger vehicle figures required another update to the portal accessory though, so once again, veteran players would have to spring for the full starter set instead of the game itself if they wanted to play. Perhaps in an attempt to compete with the branding pressure from LEGO Dimensions and Disney Infinity, Superchargers was the first Skylanders game to feature some cross-promotion of its own. And while it was less integrated than what Disney and LEGO were doing, it was still a pretty big get. They brought some Nintendo power. Both Bowser and Donkey Kong were featured and playable in the Wii and 3DS versions of the game, with exclusive figures for both characters. Since these were Nintendo characters, and Nintendo was already messing around with RFID stuff themselves with Amiibo, these figures functioned both as Skylanders toys and general Amiibo and other compatible Nintendo titles, and became chase items for both Skylanders and Amiibo completionists. The last major Skylanders title would release in 2016, titled Imaginators. It's arguably its most inventive gimmick yet. Imaginators would allow for entirely custom Skylanders characters to be created by the player. You could choose your custom character's appearance, size, class, elemental attribute, and fighting style, or generate something entirely random and see what popped out with a pretty competent character creator. Since there was no feasible way to have a figure of an entirely custom character, New toys called Creation Crystals were released that could hold custom character data and let you bring them into your friends' games. Like Superchargers, Imaginators would also feature another crossover promotion, this time featuring Crash Bandicoot, another IP owned by Activision. Originally, the figures were only available with the PlayStation version of the game, but the toys were eventually sold separately and could be used on any platform the game was released on. All told, that's a lot of plastic to collect. Combine new gimmicks that required new toys to buy to leverage those mechanics in-game, as well as a yearly release cycle, and the financial commitment to keep up with Skylanders was pretty aggressive. Every year you'd have to purchase a new retail price game, ranging from $50 to $60. Of course, that was just the game. If you wanted the actual starter set and get a jumpstart on collecting the new figures that were released with that title, those were typically $75 a pop. Unless you wanted to get the Dark Edition, which featured alternate, edgier paint jobs for the included figures, that was $99. Of course, if you were a real collector, you'd get both. But this is Activision. You can't just buy a game and expect to get the whole game you paid for. What do you think this is, 2003? Each Skylanders game would also have level packs, essentially DLC that contain new story missions and additional figures to support the story, priced at $30 to $40 a pop. We're now at almost $150 to go all in on a title. Then there were the other figures. Each release of Skylanders wasn't just a new game, it was a whole new wave of collectibles, and they all came at a cost. Each figure was priced individually from around $10 to $20 a pop. Figures could be bought as marked if you were looking for a specific character, but there were also variants. Different paint jobs, poses, holiday variants, chase variants, Toys for Bob pulled every CCG trick in the book to get the collector-minded wallets back out. 
with the exception of random packs. Despite having a plethora of figures to collect and lots of different variations, Skylanders never really went all in on blind bags. Characters were clearly labeled so you knew exactly what you were getting before you made a purchase. But I just said there were rare variants. How did that work? Well, you see, these random variants were just that. Random. The alternate versions of the common figures would just randomly be shipped amongst all the common figures to retailers, seemingly without any real structure. So if there was a particular alternate color of paint job you wanted, you were now dragging your parents all over town from store to store trying to track down the toy you were looking for with no guarantee there was even one currently in your zip code. And in a move that's just staggering. Even for Activision, Imaginators also had another new feature, a specific item you could buy called an Imaginite Mystery Chest. They came in bronze, silver, and gold varieties, and when scanned, would unlock a random assortment of in-game items of increasing rarity depending on the color of the chest. Once used a single time, that chest was locked so its data couldn't be used again on the same save file. Yes, Activision created real-life physical loot boxes. They were $9.99 each. Toys for Bob had essentially created a AAA price video game with a fully monetized collectible miniatures game scheme bolted on top. The profit potential this scheme allowed, built on exploiting children's desire for collecting, forcing their parents to drive all over creation as their kids destroyed each location Skylander section digging for a glow-in-the-dark tornado, was all but obvious, and profit they did. Skylander's figures sold like gangbusters, ranking in 300 million individual purchases by the end of 2016, with almost half of that happening in 2013 alone. It wasn't just about more playable characters either. Certain elements in the Skylanders titles required specific characters or abilities to reach, often with characters that weren't included in the starter set. So in order to access the content you already purchased in your full price retail game, you'd have to go back to the store and buy more plastic. Leave it to Activision to figure out a way to get even more egregious with on-disc DLC. Look, I'm being a bit aggressive here, but I get it. As someone who was similarly addicted to purchasing pointless plastic in high school, there's no denying the lizard brain dopamine hit of unwrapping some shiny new stuff can give. Just like my addiction though, the cost adds up quick. The first Skylanders had 30 figures in total. You got three in the starter set for $75. And if we ignore variants, level packs, and other things like retail exclusive variants and holiday promos, and go on just how much each standard figure would cost individually at retail, it would be another $270 to get the rest. By the time Imaginators was released, the total amount of unique figures, not including variants and reposes, had expanded to 166 different figures in just six years. I don't even want to do the math on what the total dollar amount would come to. This is really why, as someone graduating college at the time Skylanders released, having been burned through the entirety of my teenage years by Magic and Mage Knight, that I was so soured by this franchise merely as a concept. I'd been down this path before, and at least Wizards and WizKids didn't have the gall to mark up their starter sets to the better part of $100 while relying on a $200 plus console to play them all on. It felt like such a disrespectful way to treat Spyro the Dragon, one of the most iconic mascots of the early PlayStation brand that had defined the console alongside Crash in the late 90s, reduced to this. I don't know, Activision gonna Activision. Maybe this is an old man yelling at clouds moment. I suppose this is still better than purely digital DLC. At least you get something that actually exists in the real world once everything is said and done. They can't shut down the servers for your special jar you keep your Toys R Us limited edition legendary stealth elf in after all. The stealth elf the haunt one? I didn't dig far enough into this fandom of the game to figure out who the waifus were and I refuse to do so now. It's probably Cinder again though, isn't it? You degenerates. Like any fad though, the momentum screeched to a halt almost as quickly as it built up. With three major companies pushing hundreds of dollars of purchases a year, all vying for the same market, who ostensibly didn't have disposable income of their own, being too young to even hold a job yet, the writing was kind of on the wall from the beginning that the bubble was going to burst eventually. While Skylanders was an absolute smash hit, the fact I mentioned earlier it did half of its total revenue in a single year, despite being around for six, could probably have clued you into the momentum for the series didn't last. Games were released after Giants, while still critically and commercially successful, didn't perform to the expectations of Activision themselves. If the number isn't bigger every year, as far as an executive is concerned, it's a failure. Skylanders also had branched out into other media, releasing novels, a comic book series through IDW, and perhaps most surprisingly, three seasons of an animated television series on Netflix produced by Blizzard Entertainment? 
I mean, Activision does own Blizzard now, and the cinematic team over there makes some bangers, but still, didn't see that coming. But yeah, the series just expanded too far too quickly. The market had become saturated, and fatigue for not just Skylanders, but the entire Toys to Life genre hit hard. As an example, Skylanders Giant sold over 500,000 copies in its first two weeks on sale in 2012. By the time Imaginators launched in 2016, sales had slumped to only 66,000 in that game's first week of release. Still, Skylanders held out longer than its imitators. Disney Infinity, which didn't launch until two years after Skylanders, gave up the ghost a year before Skylanders did, with the third and final entry launching in 2015. LEGO Dimensions launched that same year and never even bothered with a follow-up at all. Skylanders would see a revival of sorts in 2018 with a mobile game release called Skylanders Ring of Heroes. Developed by com to us developers of Summoner's War, a popular mobile game that you probably remember having YouTube pre-roll ads shoved in your face back in the day, Ring of Heroes was similarly a turn-based RPG. Aside from the setting and characters, the game had little in common with the traditional Skylanders franchise, having no toys to life functionality at all, instead falling back on the typical mobile monetization strategy we've criticized to death on this channel already. The game apparently had to be rebooted in 2020 because part of the in-app purchases for the game, Soul Stones, were so egregious that they had to be removed entirely. It lasted a couple years post-reboot before being shut down in 2022, but I hadn't even heard of the game until researching this video, so needless to say, it didn't make nearly the same kind of splash its predecessors did. While Skylanders is all but dead today, it may not stay that way forever. Recently, current Activision CEO Bobby Kotick, hey, there he is, has expressed interest in reviving some previous IP, mentioning Skylanders specifically by name, along with Guitar Hero. So who knows, with all the new Microsoft money backing him, maybe we'll be seeing a new Skylanders title popping up in the next few years. I can't wait to see what kind of monetization schemes they'll cook up this time with Bobby in the driver's seat from the get-go. Oh wait, he got fired? Holy shit, there's hope!